Good evening, everyone. It is such an honor to be here. My name is Pam Lalose, and I'm going to be singing you a song from a dear friend. Her name is Tandin Duli. And this song explores, I guess, personal relationships, but essentially uh, what it means for peace to happen uh, and how uh, dialogue between those uh, can be something that we can achieve through peace.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Spong, Slimla Lose. Thank you. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, thank you for coming tonight, taking time out of your busy schedules, and joining us here in Cape Town. And thank you, all the people throughout South Africa watching us live on television. And thanks to all the people throughout the world, country after country city after city, joining us via link online. And thank you, dear Tutu family, for embracing us here tonight. Now, this is an annual event. It is a tradition. And we have been blessed, Father would have said. We've been blessed with great leaders. Great leaders that have been using their skills, experiences, knowledge, wisdom, through the lens of the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu to share with us. It's been on for 13 years. This is the lucky 13. And we have had Nobel laureates, we have had heads of states, former heads of states, we have had great philanthropists, and global human rights activists. And tonight, the bar is just set as high when we have great leadership to be presented on stage. Now, there has been a theme throughout this series of peace lectures. And that theme, besides peace, has been women. Why? Because a large number of women has given their wisdom to us. That is also the case tonight. And it's something that Father embraced. And it's aligned with his values because he always said more women should have more prominent roles leading us since men have brought us to the edge of the abyss. 
So yes, there is a dark picture being painted of the world today. It's a very gloomy picture. It's a picture where people are suffering. We have wars, we have climate change, we have institutional racism, injustice, inequalities, abuse. But is there still hope? And yes, the late Archbishop would say absolutely so. He called himself a prisoner of hope. So I'm asking you tonight if you could please step into the emotional bubble of embracing to be a prisoner of hope, just for tonight. And we'll join Father in this conceptual perspective on life. 1989, when the struggle was peaking in this very city of Cape Town, Father realized that he needed to bring people together. People from all walks of life, not only the freedom fighters, the people fighting for justice and equality, but also the very leadership of the apartheid regime at the time in the city, the institutions, the mayor and other leaders would join when they were invited by him. Can you imagine that today? That's how you can create change. But if you look around the world, you see this happening. You see the positive notion in the darkness. You see millions and millions of voices who stood up when brutal acts of Hamas took place against civilians. And you have even more millions of people throughout the entire world raising their voices to defend the Palestinian people while being massacred. You have people standing up for justice, for climate justice. You have people standing up for biodiversity and fighting climate change. You have people standing up when Floyd, George Floyd was brutally murdered in Minneapolis 2020 in the US. People walked on the streets in the United States and throughout the world because they didn't accept institutional racism. That is hope, and it is happening as we speak. So what the Arch understood, obviously, was brilliant, that we need to look for hope and we need to embrace each other. But he was also ahead of his time, 2014, almost a decade ago, he wrote the letter, a letter that could have been written today, a letter to the Palestinian people. And I read for you. He said that politicians are not cutting it for you. They're not leading you the right way. It is now the responsibility for brokering a sustainable solution to the crisis in the Holy Land lay with the people, the people of Israel, and the people of Palestine themselves, he wrote. So yes, the world is changing, and it's changing rapidly now because it's becoming a global village, we call it. Thanks to technology, we are now connected and connecting with people throughout the world. But does it really make us a village? Is our empathy and our emotional development pacing with technology? Probably not. We don't embrace those people out there as much as we would if they would have been real neighbors. And that's a dangerous view on our fellow citizens in other countries. Father would say we're one human race, we belong, there is an interdependence, there is Ubuntu. So we have to solve this. And had Father been here tonight, the arch would have said, or could have said, that we have to weave a village fabric of mutual respect and united actions to challenge and address the challenges we face. We need leaders that can weave this village fabric. Last time I checked, I personally believed in it and the late Arch believed in 
that sometimes women leaders weave better than men. Thank you and welcome to the 13th Peace Lecture. Thank you. The Desmond and Leah Dudu Legacy Foundation is the legacy organization of one of the world's most iconic leaders and his lifelong partner. Founded in 2011, the foundation strives to preserve the legacy of the Dudus while taking their example into the future. We do this by inspiring uncompromised bravery in children, youth, activists, change makers, and thought leaders to build injustice and peace around the world. We call this the courage to heal. Our goal is to nurture a generation of courageous leaders from all ages and walks of life, to have an impact in the world by embodying the values and example left to us by Archbishop Dudu. We carry his legacy as a global signpost for exceptional leadership and profound moral courage. To tackle the challenges of our time effectively, we need both technical development solutions and a new wave of action driven by courage, capacity and compassion at a societal level. This latter work to reimagine the nature of our societies is the focus of the Dudu Legacy Foundation. We do this work through three programs. Learning from Legacy. Through using the platform of the Truth to Power exhibition, we engage a wide range of audiences in learning about the story and impact of Archbishop Desmond and Mrs. Leah Dudu. We serve thousands of school learners to engage with the values of leadership, principles of democracy and the healing work needed by our society. We engage young children with the imaginative stories inspired by Desmond Dudu's own children's books. We reach the broader public in programs and efforts to tell and share stories of hope and courage in South Africa and the world. Leading for Humanity We bring together diverse groups of leaders from across society to do the work of self-repair for societal repair. Through exploring the values of compassion, Ubuntu, forgiveness, courage, and justice, our Leading for Humanity program builds a dynamic connection between the internal work we need to do as human beings and our contribution to reshaping our societies. Through our Leading for Humanity platform, we use in-person and online tools to grow diverse circles of courage around the world a network committed to justice, equality, healing, and our shared humanity. Advocacy for societal healing. At the heart of our work is the mission to extend Archbishop Dudu's commitment to societal healing, so powerfully demonstrated through chairing the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Our work for societal healing calls on us to engage in reconciliation, through which we keep trying to find each other across divides. Reparation, through which we collectively take action against injustice and oppression. And reimagination, through which we reimagine who we can be together as a society. We do this through courageous conversations, healing methodologies, and deep dialogue work to strengthen democracy, tackle violence and conflict, and build our shared humanity. Join us on this journey to reimagine our societies. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Janet Jobson, and I'll be your program director for this evening. We're meeting tonight against the backdrop, backdrop of a great test of our morality, our cohesiveness, and as the Arch would have put it, the full conception of our one human family. In my office, I have a beautiful cross-stitched tapestry that was given to the foundation, and it asks, what would Tutu do? For the past month, each time I look at that tapestry, it seems to be challenging me. <clears throat> How would Arch have responded to the horror unfolding in the Holy Land? What would he have said or done about the horror of grief-stricken Israeli families and communities, about the horror of the indiscriminate bombardment of civilian population in Gaza, the horror that while a violent assault on hospitals is broadcast to the world, our world leaders seem to not be able to even agree that it should simply stop. The horror of the trauma and the impact it will have on future generations of Israelis and Palestinians. 
What we know for sure is the scenes and the scale of the suffering of the Gazan children in particular would have moved him to tears, that he would have spent considerable time in prayer, and he would have regarded remaining neutral as an indefensible position. When he spoke out, it would have been on behalf of the voiceless. He would have spoken for justice and for peace, on behalf of the wounded, the mothers giving birth under bombs. In 2014, the last time that Gaza came under sustained Israeli military attack, the Arch joined pro-Palestinian demonstrations in Cape Town. He made a clear distinction between the policies of the State of Israel on the one hand and Israel's largely Jewish population on the other, asking the crowd to chant with him, we are opposed to the injustice of the illegal occupation of Palestine. We are opposed to the indiscriminate killing in Gaza. We are opposed to the indignity meted out to the Palestinians at checkpoints and roadblocks. We are opposed to the violence perpetrated by all parties. But we are not opposed to Jews. I'd like to ask all of you who are comfortable to, to stand for a moment of silence, to send a strong message to the perpetrators of violence that they don't represent us. The bullies with weapons in Sudan, Ukraine, Myanmar, Tigray, and the Holy Land, they don't represent us. Thank you. <clears throat> the very first Tutu Peace Lecture, at that point not international, uh, was meant to take place in 1985. However, the apartheid government banned the gathering. We're lucky that Desmond Tutu's speech from that day was later published, despite the attempts to thwart his voice. In this lecture, he noted, Peace and harmony are not fundamentally made of an absence of war or conflict. No, it is much more that peace has a positive content. It is fullness, being fully human, which can only happen in fellowship with, with each other. It is wholeness, a sense of material and physical well-being. He goes on to add, we know existentially that something has gone desperately wrong, that this is surely not how we were meant to live separated into hostile, competing, abrasive camps without much compassion for each other. It surely cannot be that we should spend such obscene amounts on instruments of death and destruction when a very small fraction of the defense budgets of most countries would ensure that children had enough to eat, had adequate housing, were provided with a clean water supply, and received an education that would ensure they were able to develop their full God-given potential. These words were banned by the apartheid government. These words of peace, they could have been said today for they're just as relevant to the current context. One of the great insights Desmond Tutu shared with us as South Africans was that our humanity is fundamentally bound up with one another. That if there is dehumanization or oppression by one group over another, it is all of us, perpetrators and victims who are dehumanized. He was clear that it was only through the liberation of black South Africans that white South Africans would find freedom. When he wrote that very first peace lecture in 1985, South Africa was under a state of emergency. Everyday life was policed and securitized. Young white men were conscripted and deployed to black communities to police, harass, and humiliate black people. Violence seemed to be the only language of the state. And yet, <laughs> Even at the height of this apartheid oppression, Tutu could see a future of love, justice, and peace for all South Africans. As we gather this evening with wars raging on our continent and abroad, with young people killing each other, our collective work is to envisage and work tirelessly for a future of love, peace, and justice across the world. 
This year, we're also very proud to honor Mama Lea Tutu on her 90th birthday. A powerful voice and activist, <laughs> yes. A powerful voice and activist in her own right, Lea Tutu also played a critical role of partnering, of bearing witness to and of consoling Desmond Tutu. It was in his relationship with her that so, he so often found the strength to go on. It was in his relationship with her that also kept him grounded, despite the lure of international celebrity. At one point, for example, he was given a gift of a hat, which did not fit. He said, oh, the hat is too small, to which she quickly retorted, no, your head is too big. <laughs> Women like Mrs. Tutu have played a fundamental role in shaping South Africa's journey. In honor of Mama Tutu, Mama, Mrs. Tutu's 90th birthday, we set out to collect the stories of 90 women who had contributed in some way, big or small, to South Africa's liberation. The 90 Voices exhibition, which you can view outside or come to the old granary building uh, to visit at another point, is the culmination of the storytelling project. I'm delighted to share a very quick video about the exhibition with you now. The title of this exhibition is The 90 Voices, Her Story. And we're playing with the word historia. Um, we're telling her story, her version of history. 90 Voices because the project was uh, a tribute to uh, our co-founder, Mrs. Leia Tutu, who turned 90 this year. We want to honor her and her life journey and her contribution to South Africa, the free South Africa that we know today, by um, celebrating many of the other women who uh, fought alongside her for this freedom. So much of the things that women did became so much a part of their lives, so much part of who they are. The roles were natural extensions, in a way, of who we are as women. And so a lot of women didn't see it as a big thing. Yet it was a very big thing to sacrifice their time, their lives, to risk their personal safety, because all of that was on the table when you were fighting the mighty uh, and brutal apartheid regime. I hope that, uh, that young people, but also others, see more, more, with more insight now how important solidarity is, the, the holding hands, the working across sectors, the connecting with one another, how powerful that can be when, you, when you're fighting a struggle. I am particularly grateful to Investec, who has sponsored the exhibition, uh, for immediately seeing the vision and coming on board to support us. I'm honored now to introduce uh, the next section of our program, the incredible poet, Tony Giselle Stewart. She's a poet, a performer, a teacher, a multi-published writer. Her work is about listening for the stories that help us reclaim our ancestral gifts and wisdom so that we remember who we truly are. Tony, over to you. Good evening, everybody. Okay, I know, I, I know we're in Cape Town. I know we, we greet better than that. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm going to read a poem tonight that is going to ask for all of your voices to join with me. And as we do this, I want us to hold in mind every single one of the 90 women who we are honoring tonight, as well as Mrs. Leah Tutu, and every single woman across this continent specifically and across the world, who in her own way has been fighting for peace, has been building for peace, has been working for peace, and has been working for justice. And, and, the, and, and think about those invisible women, the, the, you know, the ones who do work that's unseen, that doesn't get onto um, TV, that doesn't get onto radio, and hold someone that you know in your heart as, as, as we say this poem together. So this poem is called The Revolution is a Woman. It's a collective poem um, written by myself at the Fourth African Feminist Forum in Zimbabwe in 2016, where 150 women between the ages of 18 and 80 from all across the African continent gathered to share about the work that they were doing in their homes, in their countries, in their organizations. And so the poem itself takes words and phrases and ideas from the very women who were there. So it's really a collective piece. 
And what I would like everyone to do is to say this refrain with me. The poem is called The Revolution is a Woman. So when I raise my hand, I'm going to ask you to say The Revolution is a Woman. Okay, no, 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 no. <laughs> That's not going to convince anyone. Can we try that again, please? I know that there are, I, I know some of you, I know what your voices sound like when you really want to speak loudly. Can we do that again? A black queer radical, a Zanya house occupying, Shambok wielding Tahir Square protesting, raised fist, pumping, bashing, smashing, tearing down patriarchy's invisible walls. A hijab wearing, veil discarding, veil reclaiming, church going, silent praying, God denying voice, piercing through the obsidian night to reach always for the light on the horizon's edge. Reworking the histories that have shaped her, fashioning the steel of a broken arm into a power salute, molding her violated waist into an unapologetic swerving hip, shattering the chains of a shackled ankle into a defiant dancing leg, clearing the rubble under which her daughter's soul is buried, her relentless fingers scratched and bruised to let the light sear the seed turning cement into soil, this work that breaks her heart, this work that feeds her soul. Loving a woman in the shadows so she can love her children with some safety in the light, praying for strength to defend her love against the pulpit, arguing for her right to defend her love against the bench who speaks not only for herself, hear her sing, this land is woman's land, this continent is woman's continent, we will never tire, we are proudly queer, teeth biting back at the hand, muffling her voice until she breaks free into a ceaseless whispered prayer for love, an unending ululation for liberation. Born into the light of feminist fires, standing in the flames of rage and love, burning tirelessly so her sisters will not die sad. Fighting, loving, fighting, loving, fighting, loving for the soul of Nigeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Uganda, Ghana, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, South Africa, Benin, Mauritania, Zambia, Mozambique, Eswatini, Angola, Niger, DRC, Liberia, Sudan, Egypt, Senegal, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Chad, Central African Republic, Kenya, Burundi, Rwanda, Guinea, Togo, Somalia, Sudan, Algeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Malawi, Botswana, Namibia, Morocco, Madagascar, Burundi, Tunisia, South Sudan, Sierra Leone, Libya, Congo, Gabon, Lesotho, Mauritius. The revolution is a woman fighting, loving, organizing, loving, resisting, loving, building, loving for the soul, for the soul, for the soul of the world. That was incredible, thank you. It's so um, powerful to hear the collective voice in the room. Thank you so much for eliciting that from us, Tony. So I know I've kept you all waiting too long for the main event, uh, so without further hesitation, please welcome to the stage our moderator for this evening's conversation, Nozipo Shabalala. <laughs> Nozipo is the CEO of The Conversation Strategists. She's known as the go-to moderator for presidential panels globally and a champion for gender equality. And particularly important to us, Nozi is a Desmond Tutu Fellow and draws much inspiration from the legacy of the Archbishop to inform her work as a conversation strategist. Thank you, Nozi. And now it gives me great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Melinda French Gates, to the stage. Melinda French Gates is a philanthropist, a businesswoman, a global advocate for women and girls. She's the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and she works with grantees and partners to further the foundation's goal of improving equity in the United States and around the world. Through her work at the foundation for the last two decades, <laughs> Melinda has seen firsthand that empowering women and girls can transform the health and prosperity of families, communities, and societies. Over to the two of you. <laughs> Melinda, welcome back to South Africa. Welcome back to Cape Town. And I know that you've uh, spent a great deal of time in this part of the world, but this visit must be super special for you. This is, just, is really special to me. It's, it, first of all, it's just wonderful to be back uh, in South Africa. I have been here many times and in the Cape uh, several times. You may not know that my youngest daughter, I'm a mom of three um, grown children now, ages 27, 23, and 21. And my youngest daughter actually went to the African Leadership Academy here for her junior year of high school. So I spent a fair bit of time here while she was in Johannesburg. And um, also the CEO of our foundation, Mark Suzman, whose great aunt is Helen Suzman. So uh, South Africa holds a very special place in my heart. We're more than happy to have you, Melinda, and so excited for this conversation. And I suppose a really good place to start is just to pinpoint some of the projects that you are working on in this part of the world and maybe have you share with us a little bit about what have you been up to uh, on this current trip? Well, on the, this current trip, I'm doing something I've never done, which is I'm actually traveling with two other women, uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama and Amal Clooney, who heads the Clooney Justice Foundation with her husband. And it's been a really special trip. Um, we were in Malawi for two days, yeah. in particular to understand what's going on for girls in Malawi around child marriage. We wanted to go really deep on that issue, which we did. Um, and then we've been here in Cape Town now for two days as well and uh, learning about many things, but also including with uh, many survivors of gender-based violence this morning uh, yeah. and civil society who's working on those issues. I have no doubt that we're going to touch on child marriage, we're going to touch on gender-based violence, but the world is in a tough place. Um, the global agenda is crowded. What is it that keeps you focused on doing the work of bringing about a more gender-equal world? It's because we, if we want to create change in this world, we have to work towards change. And I believe the only thing, the only thing that is going to create lasting peace and change on this continent and the world is to empower women everywhere and to make sure they can step into their full power. We know that when there's more equality in a country, the country is more peaceful. Mm. We know when a woman has her full power in her home, her family is more prosperous, they're more healthy. We know then that women can contribute to their community and they can contribute to society. And so I believe that we need to make sure women can have the rightful place in society. And I work very hard to team up with others, men and women, who believe that as well and are willing to put that faith in that belief. We yeah. have to have faith in something and to put that faith into action. I want to, absolutely, absolutely. Melinda, I think I'd love to double click on this relationship between gender equality and peace because there could not be a more important time to talk about peace in the world than right now. We know that when there's conflict, that it is women and children that are likely to be displaced. It is women and children who are most likely to slip into poverty and hunger because of the economic disruption. We know that it's women and children who are likely to be the victims of sexual violence because we know that sex can be used as a weapon of conflict. And all of that actually correlates with an increase in child marriages in those afflicted societies. Tell us a little bit more about how you see the relationship between gender and peace. Well, I see gender and peace as a full circle. I was 
on a stage last night with Grasa Michelle. Yes. And, you know, one of the things that she says and that she knows from her many years of doing this work, um, as well as, you know, I think Mama Leia knew it, and I think Desmond Tutu knew it, Mandela knew it, that, you know, we have to value girls. We have to value girls the same as boys, and we have to value women the same as men. And for whatever reason, society, you know, we marry our children off. If we marry a girl, a little girl, to a man, an older man, we are immediately locking her into a cycle of poverty. She is too young to have a baby, and yet she's expected to. Yeah. She ends up with obstetric fistula or sometimes death. Her child, you start the cycle of poverty right there for that child because the children are often born preterm. Yeah. And they're low birth weight and often they're stunted. So, but it comes down to what do we value in society? Why are we marrying our girls young? Why don't we marry our boys young if we're gonna marry yeah. somebody young, right? And so when you look at that issue, which is horrific, or you look at gender-based violence, what does gender-based violence do to a woman? Mm. It silences her. It puts her in a state of trauma so without amazing counseling and healing and being able to stand back in her power, which is very, very hard, you are putting her in a terrible back situation. And that just shouldn't be. And on the flip side, when we have women at peacemaking t making tables. Yeah. So what we have come to know is only about 6% of mediators at these large peace tables are women. 9% of the people at the peace tables are female negotiators. But when they are there and their voices are heard and what is codified in those peace treaties, what happens is you get more long, durable and lasting peace. So over a 15 year period, that durable peace is 35% more likely to stay, that society peaceful, if a woman was at the table. So, assuming the woman is at the table and we're able to see that long-lasting, sustainable peace, how do we get that to translate to peace at home? Mm. Um, and the reason why I ask this question is because even as we talk about gender-based violence or whether we're talking about child marriage, all of this is probably deeply rooted in You've said it, how we value girls and how we value women and in cultural and gender stereotypes. Where have you seen us reimagining gender? And do you think that we have the capacity to transplant some of that reimagination back into the home? I know we have the capacity. We all have it in us. And it is, it is in the home. That is where it starts. We need to rethink how we talk to young boys yeah. about the men they are to become. We need to give them more role models of this is the type of man you could be. You know, of the 36 archetypes of men that you see out there, wow, here are two dozen archetypes that are just amazing. Yeah. And so it starts in the home. I mean, we teach, again, I brought up for a reason that I have a daughter, a son, and another daughter. Yeah. Like, what I taught all three children about bullying and whether it happened to them on the play playground or they saw somebody else being bullied, I expected them to stand up mm. for themselves, but for other people on the playground yeah. and to report it to me, to somebody else. And guess what? They did. But that starts in the home. Yeah. I expected my children to act a certain way and be a certain person, even when they're young. And I think we all have to think about, you know, what's happened in society that we've gotten to this place. I've, you know, South Africa, I know, looks some at itself and says, how did we get here? Well, I think yeah. there's generational trauma. And you have a lot of, you know, men who've been, we have been in very difficult, very traumatic situations. But we have to, in our homes and in our communities and in our faith groups, 
reimagine what life can be like for men and boys. Yeah. And I think by doing that in concert with other men, standing with women, and being in our homes and teaching the right way, we can change society. We yeah. absolutely can. But it does start in our home and in our community. It's a very local place it has to start. And then we have to make sure we empower women fully yeah. to step into their power so they are making decisions for society. They are equally members of parliament or equally in our senates and our house of representatives so that they're not just the recipients of policies yeah. they're creating the policies that will make things better for children starting there and all the way through society absolutely i'll take that and what i'm hearing you say is that even as we push for women to step into their power. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that concept because I hear you talking about women stepping into power rather than women empowerment. And I know that that's quite a, there's a, distant, a difference for you in that. That as we do the work of enabling women to step into, the pow into their power, we do it while in making sure that the boy child's not being left behind, while we in creating pathways for men to step into that allyship. But one of the things you talk about, Melinda, is this idea that when women progress, when women are, are, are uplifted, we uplift the whole of society as well. And you talk about a ripple effect. Paint that picture for us for a, a little bit. How, what is the source of that ripple effect and what sustains it? And how can we leverage that catalytic impact of really allowing women to step into their power as a way of lifting whole societies? Mm. Well, I believe when we're born, we're all inherently good. Like we're all inherently, you know, this beautiful child that's born on the first day, right? And a, and a little boy and a little girl each have power inside of them. So it's not up to us to empower a young girl, it's up to us to help her see that she has value, society values her, she has her power, and to help her step into it. And the difference is if you go back in the global development community, which I've now been a part of for over 20 years, shame on us, <laughs> shame on us. We, we did two things wrong, or we did many things wrong, but two things. One is we first of all only measured maternal mortality. Yeah. We measured childhood mortality and infant mortality and maternal mortality. We did not measure other things about women's lives. Yeah. We did not look at their financial power. We didn't even talk about adolescent girls, much less learn about them and their needs and what they needed. And then the other mistake the development community made was to talk about empowering a girl. Right. Well, it's not enough to empower a girl or a woman. If, it, here's the difference. So let's say a man is the main income breadwinner in the home and he's got you know 5,000 rand and he gives her 2,500 rand, yeah. but she doesn't get to decide how to spend it. He says, here's how you're gonna spend it. Then she has lost her decision-making ability and her power. Whereas if she gets $2,500 and she gets to decide how it's used or she becomes the breadwinner and she's the one earning the 5,000, it changes everything. Mm. And I've met women and grandmothers in communities who say, everybody looks at me differently right. now that I have an income, everybody. The grandmother says, men come to me for a loan. The woman says, my son looks at me differently. Mm. I can buy him a bike. My daughter looks at me differently because I can educate her. My husband looks at me differently. And so we need to really help women step into their full places of power and then make sure they get these leadership roles across society right. so that then we can look out and see three dozen archetypes of powerful women and say, wow, a girl looks up and goes, I don't want to be those kind of six women, but I'd like to be one of those 30, right? When we get there, we will really have helped women step into their equal power in society. Sure. I absolutely love um, that distinction. Um, and it's not about just women having a seat at the table because we know that representation only goes so far, but it is about them having the decision-making power when they're sitting at those seats. Um, and sometimes that seat is in your own home and being able to decide how the budget is going to be spent. 
reflecting on your book for a moment, um, one of the things that caught my attention was how you spoke about the ordinary conversations with, with women that you would have on the ground, in their communities, in their homes, and how those conversations have impacted you um, and influenced the work that you do. Melinda, what are women saying works for them? Because I think we, when we tend to have the policy conversation, we can oftentimes miss the opportunity to ask, what do women say works? Mm. So when we talk about a more gendered, equal experience, what are women wanting? They're wanting more connected networks. They, they'll say to you so often, we talk. You, you bring something new, somebody brings something new into our community and we see that it works, we're gonna tell everybody else about it. Don't worry about it. We, we talk, we talk at the well, we talk when we grind millet, we talk at the birth of the baby. We know how to spread these things, but make sure we have the resources, that we're resourced to spread it. Even the community groups that I talk to here in Cape Town today who are working on gender-based violence, and this is true wherever I go, this gender community, whether you're working on child marriage or gender-based violence or financial literacy for women or education for girls, we have starved the gender community of resources. We have resourced things for men for a long time as a world, but we have starved women's group for resources. And so they end up in these you know, situations where they're, they're almost competing with one another for resources. That just shouldn't be. They are the economic engines of society and can be, um, but we've got to resource them in the right way so that they can change society. So there are a number of funders in the room, I'm sure. Mm. So let me put you all on the spot. I won't ask you to put your hands up, but what I'd like for you to do is to think about what your current allocation of resources looks like right now. And are you contributing for the competition of resources uh, for those organizations working to bring about a gender equal world? And are you thinking about how that's impacting the work that's uh, coming through and what we are supporting? I think it's a great call to action and it's a great call out for us to do that. But let me bring you a little bit closer to South Africa, Melinda. As you would know, on the 9th of August, we celebrate National Women's Day. And in fact, we take the entire month of August to really reflect on the gains we've made as women, to reflect on some of the stubborn challenges that have remained in place. And this year, an activist made headlines for saying, and I quote, there's nothing to celebrate for women in South Africa, end quote. What do you say to those people who believe that gender equality just cannot be achieved in our lifetime, especially when they look at the everyday experiences, not only that they are faced with, but what other women are faced with on a daily basis. Mm. Well, I was actually glad to see that quote because I think that is the reality um, in some countries, we know it is. I mean, we know if you look across the world, we're supposedly 300 years away from gender equality. I don't know about you, but that is way too long for me. I know I won't be alive in 300 years. I hope I'm still alive in 30 years, right? But look, I dream about in my, gra I have a granddaughter now, she's seven yes. months old. You have a son, right, yes. that's eight months old. I dream that in their lifetime, gender equality can be achieved. Mm. And I see there are countries, if you look out, about one in three countries right now are making progress on gender equality. But most of the others are either stalled or in some cases even going backwards. I would tell you the United States went backwards in the last year and a half with the overturn of Roe v. Wade in our country. Yeah. Um, that just should not be. And yet 68% of Americans agree and say, no matter which side of the political spectrum they're on, women should have that choice. That choice belongs in their hands. It's a private decision, it's not a government decision. And so we have to keep what Amal Clooney would say is waging justice mm. on these issues. We have to wage justice. You can't assume, even when you get, we assumed in the United States that once we had that law on the books, it wouldn't be rolled back. Yeah. That is not the case. And so, but again, 
it takes collective action. And one thing that makes me incredibly hopeful, in fact, I met with three philanthropists who are here in the room just before this, and they were saying, you know, what should we, you know, in which areas, where, where do you see we're making mistakes? And it's not about what mistakes they're making, it's what we can all do, which yeah. is I see when we collaborate as philanthropists, as civil society, as government, that's when you make large scale change. And I'm excited, like being on this trip with Amal Clooney and Michelle Obama, we are talking about how do we collaborate so that what each of us is doing with our own foundations is not one plus one plus one equals three, but yeah. it equals six or it equals 10. Like we can work in collective in ways and with civil society and government that we can amass large scale change, but it does mean locking arms and really working together. I absolutely love this idea of collaboration, the idea of locking arms, interlinking, amplifying the impact, as you could say, one plus one must equal six instead of two or three. What needs to be true for those collaborations to really work? Because I think what we sometimes want to see is a whole of society approach. Everybody wants to solve the problem. So we all jump in, but there's no coordination, there's no coherence, and what we tend to create is noise and what we tend to create is probably inertia. What are the basic ingredients of effective collaboration for transformative change that you say these have got to be in place if we're going to see a transformative change in the gender issue? Well, I look at your own country. I look at what this says that Desmond Tutu said. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. I mean, Look how long it took. It was, I mean, I was a college student when some of what was going on with apartheid and finally the world was really paying attention and it was not at all a given. In fact, I would say the odds were stacked against South Africa having a peaceful change. I mean, it's, it's almost miraculous when you look back about the peace that actually occurred, the peaceful transition. and. But it was a strategy. It was a strategy that said, we want equality in this country for blacks and for whites. And you had, a, you had different groups pushing together. My understanding of Tutu going again through the, um, you know, through the museum today, not again, but learning again about his work, was he wasn't expecting to be a leader. It was because the ANC, the political parties had had to go underground and were jailed. He was called to be a leader, but there was a strategy there and there were a lot of people, what I say, pulling on the oars to try and head right. towards justice. And so I think in gender, we need to be more organized. We mm -hmm. absolutely have to say, this is what can be achieved in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 and 40, and then we've got to organize ourselves. And you've got to organize in different countries and in different ways. You also have to create more women's networks. I see too many places in the world where a young man, let's say he gets college educated, is able to, he steps into these immediate networks. Men reach out and grab him and say, come work on Wall Street, come yep. work here. Women do not have those networks. They, they have social networks, they talk to each other, but those networks that pull them up and say, you're ready, come here, let me give you this opportunity, let me open these doors for you. And so we've got to create networks where we're funding and we're all pulling on the oars to say, let's get women into their full power. It's a beautiful analogy, I'm seeing a few hands there. It's a beautiful analogy, Melinda, as we think about um, those oars in, um, in, in sync, um, mm -hmm. pulling against the water together. Um, but as you talk about resourcing, coordination, but also networking is all important. You speak about a collaborative effort that really pulls on different stakeholders in society. One of those stakeholders, though, that we often forget completely, we eclipse them completely when we're talking about women and leadership and women stepping into their power is the informal sector. It's almost as if um, women in leadership and the informal sector cannot be strung together in one sentence. You, on the other hand, are very intentional about not doing that. Why is it? What, do, what are you seeing in the informal sector and the role that women play that many of us are often missing in our own conversations. Mm. So 
women in the informal sector, which so many women are in many places on the continent, just one thing just to know about how I, how I go into these conversations with women is I always try to say to myself, what if I was in her shoes? Yeah. I had this number of children and I'm trying to figure out how to eke a life out for myself. What would I do? Like, you know, which, which job would I take? Where would I go? Um, and so often the women in the informal sector are figuring out how to eke out a life. And we haven't counted their labor in the past. Mm. And that's because, again, if you look at economists across the world, if you go back 50 years, most of the economists were men. Yeah. And so they knew how to measure in society, you know, in a manufacturing facility, okay, this much work, this much output, this much input, output. But they didn't really look at what women were doing. Women are doing massive labor in their home, in their kitchen, on their farm. Um, and that unpaid labor was never measured. And yeah. in fact, it equals about 12 billion hours a week around the world. Sure. So we can put a value on that. And in fact, our economies are built on the backs of women's unpaid labor, taking care of the young, taking care of the old. So I look at those women in the informal sector and they sometimes have the hardest jobs because they're the ones that have had to figure it out often on their own. And so I look at how do we, you know, how do we make sure they can actually get credit, get a loan, yeah. get their business and start to scale it. And I'm meeting women across the continent who are managing to do that. But again, how do we make sure that there's angel investing or venture capital investing or a bit of credit so they're not taken by the lender who's got you know a 19 or 30 percent sometimes uh credit mm. your loan rate that they've got to pay back it's just insane so i'm hearing two threads here so there's the one is the conversation around access to finance and i'd love us to double click on that but the second one is the issue of time poverty um and if we maybe start with time poverty we learned from the pandemic um, because what was revealed was the burden of care that women carry relative uh, to men within the context of their families and the fact that women are far more time poor. And we trace that back to some of those gender stereotypes all over again. Are we making progress? Um, a few years on, maybe it's still a bit early, post the pandemic, has that revelation started to translate into changing the way we, we allow men and women to use their time. I think you have to go country by country and see if that has changed. But I, I wouldn't say, I would say one thing in the United States, we still don't value care in the same way, but part of the reason you have so many workers saying they don't wanna go back, you know, in the United States, there's this big tension right now where work, people are wanting to work from home. They're still working from home. And it's because the women are saying, my gosh, it's the only way I can make it work. I've somehow managed to make it work while yeah. I have children and I can work. Because there's what women need, they're telling us, is flexibility. But we have lost, in the childcare sector, we've lost hundreds of thousands of childcare centers in the United States after the pandemic. So. This child care issue, no, I don't think the world has woken up to it. And it is, we've done some surveying across Africa and it is a huge issue for women in terms of why they can't go into the formal sector or they can only spend a certain number of hours on their informal sector work because they've got a child. Yeah, and uh, I sit here as a, a mother to an eight month old and you know, we listen to these words and you begin to reflect on how do I change the conversation in my own home so that the product of the time allocation is different to what we've been used to. But let me then go back to the other issue, which was the access to finance. You know, oftentimes when we think about uh, women in business or women in entrepreneurship in the South African context, the picture that comes to mind is, and we often see this on annual reports of big companies, um, is a picture of a woman at a food store uh, in a market. Um, and they make for beautiful pictures because they're bright and colorful. But what they're also telling us is that we don't often see women breaking out of the informal uh, sector when it comes to business and really building um, institutions and organizations that last. When you think about the potential that access to finance can have, 
what excites you most about the future we can create if we can really unlock finance for women entrepreneurs? If we could really unlock finance for entrepreneurs, you would see far, I mean, the entrepreneurship is the engine of society, of the innovations of society, right? And so if you could unlock venture capital funding, you would start to see far more businesses that, that can grow from a small to a medium to a large size business. And I think you would start to see more women as heads of business. We have this problem even in the US, which is only 2% of venture capital funding goes to a black woman, 2% or less. 4% if you're a white woman, okay? So, I mean, and yet women have incredible ideas for business, but we have this idea that because the venture capital community has been held by men, they tend to only fund what they know and can see, and they're funding the same things, which is men, you know, male-led businesses. So one of the things I'm trying to do, not for the foundation, but my company, Pivotal Ventures, which is really focused on inequity in the U.S., is to lead in the venture capital space to show people you're leaving money on the table. There are all these amazing women-led businesses. We need to capitalize them, and I expect a good return, but those will grow into engines for our economy. Here on the continent, one of the things the foundation is doing is putting money into artificial intelligence and even grants that people can come get if they've got an idea, let's say, around women's health and AI, because AI is going to change our lives. It is changing some of our lives already, but we've got to get it fueled on this continent so that these amazing innovators, when I look out across the continent of Africa, I just see so much potential. The median age is 19. You know, I've met young people in these tech hubs in Nigeria, in Kenya, in, in Nairobi, in Senegal. They, they are, have great ideas and applications for the continent, but they've got to be funded, right? And to me, there's just huge potential there for creating lasting change. And yet, you know, we got to channel funds there. Mm. We've got to channel funds uh, towards women and in business. As we begin to make our way towards the end of our conversation, I really want to shine the spotlight on what needs to be done. What is the job to be done for all of us in the room? If we think about leaders right now, and if we could highlight some concrete steps uh, that you think, if these steps are taken, we're going to accelerate and minimize that 300 year um, you know, gap that we're talking about, accelerate our path towards gender equality. What are these steps? What are the things that leaders should be thinking about and that we should be holding them account to account for? Well, I think, you know, everybody in this room or anybody who's watching, you, you, you know young girls and young boys who could be great leaders in your communities. If you're in a faith-based organization or you're in a school or in your community, it is up to us to identify and tap them on the shoulder and give them opportunities. Give them the first internship. Show them the way to get into a network. Make sure that we teach them how to be proper moral leaders of society as well as potentially business leaders or political leaders. And then network them together. The Tutu Fellows can be networked together with the Obama Fellows and the Clooney Fellows and the Cambridge Scholars that we have who come from the continent. I mean, if we put our collective efforts together and say we are trying to teach all of these young people about how to be leaders in their society, then I think we would start to see lasting change. And we have to then listen to them and their ideas have to come forward and we have to fund them. I mean, I look at, I do look at climate change and say, you know, it's been, you know, it's been 25 years of funding that's kind of gotten the climate change movement to where it is. And I look at universities, for instance, where you're starting to see these climate clubs raise up, you know, 400, 500 students for climate change and climate justice. It's fantastic. When I look back, it's because we taught little kids, at least in some countries, how to recycle, and they were expected to recycle and be the recycling monitor in the classroom. These kids have grown up and are saying now, okay, I'm in college, we wanna actually do something, and they've got ideas, and some of them are going out and getting funded. We need that in gender. We need that for young women and people who believe in democracy and peace. We need to network them, grow them up, and then get them to a level and then help fund their ideas and listen to their ideas. 
Melinda, there's one constituency that I realize we haven't spoken about, and those are the young people who maybe are listening to this lecture of uh, a mobile phone somewhere, they most likely unemployed, and as we talk about the median age being 19 uh, on the continent, they're probably thinking, well, that conversation doesn't relate to me because I'm not part of the economically active population. How do we begin to think about bringing in uh, those who are at the periphery, especially from an unemployment perspective, and really being intentional about bringing the threads of gender and employment creation and economic growth together, because we cannot continue to solve for those who are just at the center. We've got to think about um, a much bigger one billion population on the continent, which are the young people that you referred to earlier. So every other person on this continent has a phone. <laughs> That's a pretty amazing thing. Yeah. And while some of them are still, you know, the plastic phones, that is a tool we did not have over a decade ago. And a person with their own bank account, man or woman, who can save a dollar a day, save $2 a day, even if they're at the margin, when people learn to save money and save it up, they then have something when the health shock comes, the hunger shock comes, the school fees come due. The power in that phone of information for learning, the power of being able to save and have some economic means, and there are good apps now that say, look, if people save, they're then more credit worthy, right? Even if they've never been part of the formal financial sector, Women will tell you out in remote rural villages, I've been out in them, and they'll say, look, I wasn't, I couldn't go on the bus. I went, I'm not welcomed at the bank. I didn't have the money for the transport. I didn't have the time. But my gosh, I've got a phone, and I can save a little bit of money, you know, from the, the vegetable stall they do have, or their husband goes into work, and they have it in their hands. Money does, money is power and yeah. it literally starts to make them more powerful. And then, as I said, the way they're seen is different. So I would say if you have a phone, there are things you can learn and you can do. And even, you know, one thing we have not talked about but that I am very passionate about is contraceptives. Yeah. And why is that? There is literally no country, not one country in the world that hasn't gone from low to middle income without making the contraceptive prevalence journey. Once women have control and can say, these are the number of children I want, whether they have children and when they have children, when they have that ability, women will t do tell us, and I can lo name lots of names of women I've met even on the continent, and they'll say, if I can only have two or three children, I can feed those two or three, yeah. and I can put them into school, and I can see my dream of a better life for my children and my family. Well, the phone, what we're learning from Nigerian girls, is they are spreading the world word in very unique ways about contraceptives, about their bodies, about why condoms are important so yeah. they don't get STIs from their partner. And they're spreading, where can you go? When there are stockouts, we can go here. When, yeah. when we, we can get them covertly over there. So that cell phone and the tools that we have, these more modern tools, I call mo contraceptive a modern tool, that is, will change society. And in, even in the United States, what allowed women to go into university and then the workforce en masse, it was the advent, advent of the birth control pill. Sure. And that's absolutely powerful because it comes back to your earlier message of decision-making power and the ability to make decisions about your body, about your family, within the context of your community. One of my core beliefs is that conversations are the birthplace of action and that we have to be very intentional about the conversations we start because I think those are the ones that help us bring about a different future and also very intentional about the conversations we stop because those are the ones that ensure that we stop reproducing outcomes that we don't want. As a parting message to everyone in the auditorium, online, across the world, what is the conversation you would have us start 
from tonight? And what is the conversation you would have us stop to never have again from tonight? Let me start with what I would stop. I would stop saying it's impossible. Of course, <laughs> of course it's possible. We are the ones that create change. We just are. I mean, if we want society to be different, it is up to us. <laughs> and to every one of us and to every little girl and boy who goes to school, you know, we know that when families can get on the cycle of good health, education, and economic opportunity, society changes and then you get a more peaceful society and people can stay if they choose and live in their community and be prosperous and so when women have their rightful place in that society is more peaceful and so what i want to say to everybody is you know we have to have hope don't ever give up hope desmond tutu says it we we have to have hope but I also want to tell you that love is a verb and it's an action and we can do something about it in our homes for that young girl, for that young boy, for that woman who is trying to make her way to CEO or that woman who is facing violence on the campaign trail, but she would be an amazing parliamentarian. Love in action is saying to that person, you can do this, I know you can do this, and I've got your back. I'm gonna help you get there. So that's the conversation you would have us stop, that it's not to stop saying it's impossible. What do we start from tonight? A new conversation that we haven't had before that you think could contribute to bringing about a more gender equal world? I think having the conversation that what we all really hope and dream for is peace. We want peace in our lives. We want peace in our homes. If we don't have it, we need to change that. And we want peace in our communities. And I think the conversation is that we have to remind one another, you know, we have to connect with our humanity, mm. right? And, and to say to ourselves, you know, what is it I don't know about this person? Yeah. What do I not know? Or my son said to me before he went off to college, I was kind of blown away. Uh, he said, I'm going to college, mom, and every person I encounter, I'm going to think, what is the one or two things I might learn here from them that would change my mind? Mm. Would change my mind about something I thought I knew. Like we all have bias. I have bias. I know I have bias and I try and see where it shows up. And then I have to look at that and, and say, okay, well, could somebody change my mind? I have met so many men and women around the world who have changed my mind on things. I went in thinking I knew what a solution was. I had no clue. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, we have to say to ourselves, Find the humanity in the other person and reach out. And the other thing I would say is, you know, we do have to learn to, to deal with our emotions. Emotions are just emotions. Yep. And, you know, I try to take some time in quiet every single day. Or today, like when I went to this session on gender-based violence, you know, it was really hard. Not as hard for me as, the my God, the women who've been through this, but hard. And I had to take some time and quiet to deal with those emotions so I don't put them on somebody else, yeah. right? And I think so often we're on our phones now and we're scrolling and we're going here and there. We just got to put it down and just say, you know, let's find the humanity in one another. Let's reach out if I'm having a hard moment. Um, let's find time to deal with our emotions. I was lucky enough to go to an all-girls Catholic school, very liberal nuns in high school. And they taught us, though, that you know we needed time in quiet, yeah. but that love is in action, and the actions we take on behalf of the world. So I think I would leave everybody with one thing, and that is, I was asked to do a speech for my high school graduation, and my end quote that I believed in high school and I believe together is that if you leave this world better by lifting up one person, one person, that is a successful life. 
And I would say everybody in this room can lift up at least one person, probably a few hundred. Ladies and gentlemen, in true South African style, I'm going to ask us to give Melinda French Gates a resounding round of applause and even a ululation. I'll take it. Wasn't that wonderful? Um, my heart is very full, and I, I loved um, that Melinda picked up on the quote of hope is being able to see the light despite all of the darkness, and I'm truly filled with hope after that engagement. Yes, thank you, whoever gave the, <laughs> the little whoop. Um, so thank you to Nozipo and Melinda. It was, it was truly a, a powerful conversation. You know, central to our work at the Tutu Legacy Foundation is that we want to build platforms for emerging leadership and grounded insights. And so in line with this, we've asked this evening an incredible uh, young academic and poet, uh, Dr. Atambile Masola, to give a short reflection on that conversation. Atambile is a writer, a researcher, and an award-winning poet based in the Department of Historical Studies at the University of Cape Town. Her debut collection of poetry was written in Isikosa, and it's called Ilifa. She's the co-author of children, a children's history book series, Imbokodo, Women Who Shape Us, and her latest book is a collection of Noni, Noni Jababu's columns from 1977 called A Stranger at Home. Atta, please can you come up and share with us your thoughts? Good evening, everyone. Molueni. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. Dickens, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry for Dickens. Let's pretend it wasn't Dickens. <laughs> but I start with that because in moments like this, it is good to hold both the light and the dark. And it's difficult to live with the light and the dark. And I start this way because the line from the song's Pa Sang, Tandinduli's song, gave me courage. And the first line of that song was, why can't we tell the truth about how it feels? It is hard. It has been a hard, hard season. And I think it's important to just say it. That's where we began with the chair. That's where Janet began, but it must filter through everything that we have to say. We have to hold the light and the dark. And so that's where I want to begin. It is the best of times, having conversations like this, gathering tonight, but it is also the worst of times. It is a time of mourning. It's hard to gather. The chair spoke about this being a tradition. And the beauty about tradition and rituals is that on the one hand, we are able to witness and we're able to mark the moment, but we're able to do it honestly. And we must do it honestly. Rituals can only happen when there is honesty. Growing up when we had rituals, the refrain would be, and my dead bumnyama buvelo kukanya in this moment. 
There's been a lot of talk about generational time tonight. Long time, deep time, thinking about families, thinking about generations. And I want to borrow the idea from Elise Boulding, the idea of a 200 year present. And the idea is that you think about the oldest person in your life, and in our case, we're celebrating Mamalea's 90th. Think of a centenarian, think of the oldest person in your life, Mamalea's turning 90. And think of the youngest person in your life. We heard of Nozi and Melinda's seven and eight month old children and grandchildren. And that our lives span those lifetimes. And so the work that we do in our lives spans a 200 year present. And so how do we live understanding that time is long and that the work that we do in rituals like this, in gatherings like this, has implications. And I guess that's what gives me hope, generational time, is that once upon a time, this would have never been possible. That once upon a time, it wasn't even imaginable that we would be having conversations like this. And so that it's possible then to imagine that once upon a time, Palestine might be free. And so time gives me hope. Understanding that people like Mamlia and the Arch understood that time, that they were sowing into a future that they might not necessarily enjoy. Mamlia has, she's 90, and we're so grateful. But I guess the invitation for me and the conviction I am sitting with tonight is my relationship with the future and how to best craft a future where we can tell the truth about how it feels. Where we can tell the truth about how hard hope is. But we can also tell the story about how people lived and worked for that hope. I want to end with a small story to give a sense of that generational time and the stories that give me hope. In 1935, a young teacher walked into Inanda Seminary. Her name was Pumlangozwana. She was a teacher at Adams. And she made a speech at Inanda Seminary. And the speech made it into a newspaper called The Bantu World. And the title of the article that was then published in The Bantu World was The Emancipation of Women. This was in 1935, that a young black woman was also thinking about the emancipation of women in the same way we were thinking about the emancipation of women today. And so that gives me hope, is that we are part of a long conversation. We are not alone. We have eons and eons of work behind us, and that perhaps in the future, in 200 years time, they will be telling a different story. And I do believe there will be a future. There was a wonderful poster, I think it was an exhibition at the St. John's Cathedral in New York a few years ago. And it said there are black people in the future. And I thought to myself, wow, the fact that we even need to make statements like that, I think it was in the wake of Black Lives Matter protests a few years ago. But that we can make those declarations, that there are Palestinian children in the future there are Sudanese children in the future. There are African children in the future. There are Congolese children in the future. And so that's what gives me hope. And so thank you, Spa, for choosing Tandy's song so that we can be courageous and speak about how it feels. How it feels to be a young person in a world that seems to constantly be asunder. In one year, we've moved from Ukraine in the headlines, and now we're, our gaze is turned on another country, and we constantly have to be juggling all these, these burdens and all these heartaches. But in the heart of that are gatherings like this. And we thank the foundation for choosing to gather in spite of that difficulty, because we must be reminded of our humanity, and rituals remind us of that humanity. And this is a public ritual that we need every single year, if only to gather and witness each other's humanity and hug each other and see each other and cry and be incredulous with each other because it has been a time of incredulity 
and a time of despair. Thank you. Hard to know what to say after something <laughs> as powerful as that. Um, so it's my great delight to welcome back up Spa Mglolose and her band. I think to bring, um, thank you, thank you so much, Asen Bille, for mentioning the song as such an inspiration because we need to feel in multiple ways. And music is one way that we can certainly feel in the heart. So, Spa, over to you. Hello again. So, um, how do I tell the story? About five years ago, I released an album. And just for context, I'm Zulu speaking. Uh, so I had no business writing this next song, which is fully in Sibedi. <laughs> and let me tell you, it has put me in very awkward situations when people want to converse further in Sibedi, a language I do not know. <laughs> um, but yeah, this one is called Lefatsi. And please give it up for this incredible band on guitar, Nathan Carolus, on trumpet, Moniv Herman, and on drums, Marlon Vitboy. I will be putting you on the spot. I've heard your voices. You all get the gold card. We're going to Sun City. So there will be a time where I give, when I turn the spotlight on you, yeah? Lola, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ole, yeah. Ole, yeah. Papa. Lola, yeah, yeah, yeah.
your time. Money Bowen, everybody. So remember that time I said I needed you? SOS, SOS. We're going to teach you something super simple. It goes just like this. You got it? Let me do it one more time. Let me do it one more time. Okay, I'll cue you guys. I'll cue you. Nearly there, nearly there. Like, like, a, like a fornyana. Okay, here we go, Cape okay, Town. I know you can do this. I'm not expecting anything from the side anymore. <laughs> this is gonna be our last number, so I'm asking, I'm pleading for you to all get on your feet. Sing it if you know it. This is a classic from the great Miri Makeba. And it's called Wele. Lily Zellam, Lily Zell. Oh, now the lift comes alive. Okay. I see you. What's a what's Sing 
One more round of applause is uh, due for that. It feels like the evening just gets deeper and deeper, more and more into one's heart. <clears throat> As we move towards the end of this evening's gathering, I'd now like to invite up a massive supporter of ours, uh, the UN resident coordinator at Interim, Christine Mohigano, who's going to share some final thoughts with us this evening. Christine, welcome. Miss Leia Tutu and the uh, Tutu family, the board and staff of the Desmond and Leo Tutu Legacy Foundation, the board of Archbishop Tutu, Intellectual Property Trust, distinguished members of the Consulate Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all of you here gathered, 
Good evening, and what a, an honor, what a privilege, um, what a pleasure for the United Nations family to be here with you tonight. I bring greetings from the United Nations Resident Coordinator, Mr. Nelson Mufu, who is currently in New York, as well, of, as, well as all the good wishes of the United Nations country team here in South Africa. It is indeed an honor for the United Nations in South Africa to partner with you, the Desmond Tutu and Leah Legacy Foundation, on this occasion, the 30th Annual Peace Lecture. The United Nations believes in the transformative power of women. We know that when women lead, societies change for the better. As the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres says, the participation of women in mediation and decision making is vital to conflict resolution. Their analysis is critical to understanding conflict dynamics and building effective response and prevention strategies. Studies also show that the active engagement of women peace builders increases the chances of lasting peace. Indeed, women bring a unique perspective and challenge the status quo, thereby driving us towards peace, towards prosperity, towards justice. Women like Mrs. Leah Tutu, who has dedicated her life to the fight for justice and equality. As one of the founders of the Domestic Workers Alliance and a crucial figure of the Soweto, Soweto YMCA, she has been a beacon of hope and resilience. Last month marked Mama Leah's 90th birthday and I hope it is a moment to reflect not only on the power of her lifelong commitment to justice and equality, but may it serve as a moment of inspiration and aspiration for all of us. Tonight, we also recognize and celebrate Miss Melinda French Gates. How inspiring, how how heartening it is and it was to listen to her uh, tonight. She has demonstrate, demonstrated her commitment to empowering women and girls around the world. Her belief that gender equality lifts everyone resonates strongly with the values of the United Nations and our human rights principle to leave no one behind. The United Nations steadfastly supports the mission of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation, a mission to deepen healing for societal transformation. The foundation's work, especially through these annual peace lectures, is a testament to the enduring values of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. He is no longer with us, but his spirit of peace, justice, and reconciliation lives on and, inspire, and inspires, inspires all. Archbishop Tutu's commitment to ordaining women into, into the priesthood was groundbreaking. His belief in women as powerful agents for societal change continues to inspire us. Therefore, the title Unlocking Women's Power for Peace and Prosperity should not just be a lecture title, but we must endeavor to make it a reality. <clears throat> to achieve this requires a steadfast commitment to challenge the structures that hinder women's participation and to create opportunities that empower them. 
Melinda French Gates says, says it, said it so eloquently this evening. Sustainable development goal number five calls for gender equality and women's empowerment across all sectors of society so that every woman, every girl lives up to her full potential. Despite this though, women are still excluded from peace processes and negotiations. And we need to see more intentional steps to ensure that this status, this status quo is disrupted. On behalf of the United Nations, I extend my deepest gratitude to the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation for their tireless efforts in keeping the legacy of Archbishop Tutu alive. Through initiatives like these, the foundation continues to galvanize the courage, the courage to heal, to reconcile differences, and to inspire new societal transformations. The United Nations in South Africa reaffirms our support to the foundation as we collectively work to accelerate the sustainable development goals in South Africa so as to ensure that indeed no one, no, women, no woman, no girl is left behind. Allow me to close with the words of the beloved Archbishop, Archbishop Tutu, until women are deeply involved in opposing the violence in the world, we are not going to bring it to an end. I thank you. Thank you, Christine, for that and for the incredible partnership. This evening really would not have been possible without our extraordinary sponsors. Um, I have to say again, Investec, who immediately saw the vision for the 90 Voices, and I really do hope as many of you as possible manage to take a look at the exhibition and hopefully to find some of those incredible women sitting here in this audience tonight. Uh, the United Nations has been a critical partner, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Terre Passable, and the Western. The work we do as the foundation is to preserve and expand the legacy of the Tutus, and it's only possible through the support of generous donors, many of whom are individuals that have been touched by the, or experienced the impact of Desmond and Leia Tutu around the world. One of the great lessons that has emerged for me tonight is the power of everyday people, making change every, every day, wherever they are, in their homes, in their communities, in their societies, to make peace a reality. It's times like this in the world that we miss the voice of the arch the most. His voice was one of moral clarity, and it was so often a guide for us in a broken world. So as we all take up his legacy, may we all play our part to become healing points in an aching world, to become points of light, points of hope in the darkness. We couldn't have an event tonight without hearing directly from the Arch, and so we're going to close with a final video in which he shares his words himself. Can we cue that up? The tidal wave of change is made up of a million ripples. Just hey. He's, he's the hunter. Maybe I can. And, and it builds up. And it builds up. And it builds up. You can change the world. You can change the world. You must not pass now. Do not let them down.
and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. Is a person to other persons. The essence of being human. It could be to any number of band to book to a banya sebeli gesele bata kodi kundu. On those strobes to a little to pass it to us, not the sun in a room to go to Yana and if only the person is a person to other persons. Change is not over. Whoever is a perpetrator, as long as I have breath in my body, I will stick up a clean injustice. Watch out. Watch out. To narrow the gap between between the head and the head not. I cannot worship a homophobic God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Wouldn't it be wonderful if wouldn't it be wonderful if Babes Pidisana Nenda Lokobalom Tabas P CIA Pandi Pashale to self Climate change is for real. Now time is now. It is the younger generation leading the way. Do what you can where you can. some deep inspiration in what has been shared this evening. Please drive home safely and look after yourselves. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>